Well, it is a privilege to be with you uh, this morning and to uh, celebrate uh, pastoral ministry. Uh, the last time I spoke in chapel was about a decade ago, and I was an expert. An expert is anyone who is uh, more than 100 miles away from home. And from uh, here to uh, my driveway in Belgrade, Montana, it was about uh, uh, 1,380 miles, almost 1,400 miles. Uh, today, though, I'm not an expert. Uh, I'm, I, it took me 8.3 miles from driveway to, to get here. Uh, but uh, I, I feel honored to be here and, and to think about pastoral ministry. Uh, my friend Dave Hansen, uh, in his book, uh, uh, The Art of Pastoring, said that, that he feels like uh, over the years he was not necessarily a great pastor, maybe not even a good pastor. He says it's enough uh, to be a pastor, and I feel a little bit that way uh, today, and I look forward to uh, sharing Scripture with you uh, both uh, today and then on, on Thursday and to uh, look into God's Word together and then to uh, answer questions uh, that you might have about uh, pastoral ministry or, or even preaching uh, next uh, door at uh, noon. Uh, would you join me as I uh, pray for our time this morning in, in God's Word? Father, I thank you that you are a talking God. I thank you that you have spoken through uh, your Son and you've spoken through your Word. And I pray that as uh, we open up your Word, that you might help us to receive it for what it is. Uh, not the Word of a human being, but the Word of God, which has its power to perform its work in our lives as believers. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Growing up, I was taught that God will never put you in a situation that you cannot handle. No matter how dark the valley, no matter how bitter the trial, God will not give you more than you can handle. Now, how many of you have been uh, told that in, in a time of difficulty? Uh, you have uh, uh, come here to Trinity and, and you're studying and doing your best, but uh, a lot of months, uh, the, the money runs out before the month does, and, and then your transmission uh, uh, goes uh, you know, kaput in your car, and, and then you find out that your, your infant son or daughter has asthma, and then you, you get word from home that another family member has cancer, and you wonder, uh, how much more can I take? I, I can't handle this. And, and some believer comes to you and says, look, Hannah, you know, look, Josh, uh, just remember, God will never give you more than you can handle. I used to tell people that, but I have to confess, I no longer believe that. It's not because I suddenly had a crisis and don't believe Scripture. I think I take Scripture more seriously than ever. But I'm not convinced as I read Scripture that Scripture promises that God will never give us more than we can handle. Oh, I know, 1 Corinthians 10, 13 is in my Bible as well, and I'm, I'm aware that, that God will not let us be tempted beyond what we are able to bear, but I'm not sure that that suggests that God will never allow or put us in situations that we can't handle. I would invite you this morning to take your Bible and turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 30. 1 Samuel chapter 30, I want you to see this morning that God may well put his people in situations they can't handle, and I want you to see why God does that. When we come to 1 Samuel 30, we meet David. Uh, David is the anointed king, but he is in that stretch of time that we call his wilderness years. He is on the run from King Saul. And he's on his way home to Ziklag. It's quite a story how he got there. Uh, David, over time, attracted this band of, of warriors, this rather motley crew, and it, it grew to about 600. And, and even in the, the wilderness in Judea, there's only so many places you can hide. And Saul constantly has uh, his, his scouts uh, watching out. How do you hide 600 warriors? And finally, David decided that he had to take matters into his own hands. And, and of all things, he went to the Philistines. He sought refuge. Uh, one of the, the Philistine lords, uh, Achish, uh, invited him to become his personal bodyguard. And uh, for a while, it worked out. But the day came when David was uh, invited to go into battle against, uh, you guessed it, against the people of Israel. 
Uh, but fortunately, the night before the army took off to that battle, uh, some of the other Philistine leaders had second thoughts, and they complained about uh, David and his men coming along. They said, in the heat of battle, he's going to switch sides. Of course, Achish would have none of it, but he said, well, all right. And he told David, look, I'm sorry, uh, but uh, you, you might as well go home to uh, Ziklag, that town that I gave you, because uh, the other leaders just aren't going to have you. So in 1 Samuel 30, we meet David on his way home, due, I believe, to God's providence in his life. And David is coming back now to, uh, to his family, back to the, the town where he lived with his men. And in 1 Samuel chapter 30, Beginning in verse 1, we read, David and his men reached Ziklag on the third day. Now the Amalekites had raided the Negev and Ziklag. They had attacked Ziklag and burned it and had taken captive the women and everyone else in it, both young and old. They killed none of them, but carried them off as they went on their way. When David and his men reached Ziklag, they found it destroyed by fire and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. Now, you have to appreciate that David and his men did not have the insider information that the narrator gives us at the end of verse 2, that these warriors had killed none of them but carried them off as they went on their way, perhaps to sell them into slavery, perhaps to use them later as bargaining chips. Uh, we're not quite sure what the reason is, but David and his men don't know this. And so it's not surprising that in verse 4 that David and his men wept aloud until they had no strength left to weep. David's two wives had been captured, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. David was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him. Each one was bitter in spirit because of his sons and daughters. I don't know about you, but that sounds to me like a situation that is more than any person can handle. In fact, in verse 6, David was greatly distressed. I mean, he was, uh, uh, he was literally between a, a rock and, and a hard place. He was in a tight spot. So what does David do? What does David do in, in a situation like this? And I would suggest to you that we too find ourselves in situations like this, not only in life, but even in pastoral ministry. The end of verse 6, we read that David found strength in the Lord his God. Uh, literally, David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Do you ever wonder what that looks like? Well, I don't think we have to try to imagine what that looks like. I think it's fairly clear if, if we think through Scripture and if we think about the many psalms that David wrote. I'm quite sure, based on Psalm 19, that David would have strengthened himself in the Lord by uh, going to Scripture and, and reminding himself of the promises of God and the power of God. I have no doubt that, that David also would have prayed and, and cried out to the Lord in words uh, very similar to what uh, Elizabeth read for us a few moments ago from Psalm 25. Uh, Joyce Baldwin, a biblical scholar, thinks that that may have been written uh, in this particular circumstance. Uh, no way of proving that, no superscription that tells us that, but regardless, it's the kind of prayer that David might have prayed. He, he strengthened himself in the Lord. What happens next is interesting. In verse 7, as a result of that, David said to Abiathar, the priest, the son of Ahimelech, bring me the ephod. Abiathar brought it to him, and David inquired of the Lord, shall I pursue this raiding party? Will I overtake them? Pursue them, he answered. Now you will certainly overtake them and succeed in the rescue. I find this interesting for a couple of reasons, a couple of contrasts here. One of the contrasts is with David himself and David in some of his prior behavior. I want you to go back for just a moment to, second, or to 1 Samuel chapter 23 and just pick up the storyline. 1 Samuel chapter 23, 
again during David's wilderness years, uh, when David was told, look, the Philistines are fighting against Kila and are looting the threshing floors, he inquired of the Lord, saying, shall I go and attack these Philistines? The Lord answered him, go, attack the Philistines and save Kila." But David's men said to him, here in Judah we are afraid. How much more then if we go to Kila against the Philistine forces? And once again, David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord answered him and told him what he had told him before, told him he would be successful. A little while later, down in 1 Samuel 23, verse 9, when David learned that Saul was plotting against him, he said to Abiathar the priest, bring the ephod. So here's David. What's remarkable about this chapter may be what's not so remarkable, and that is that, that David is a man who was in the habit of calling on the Lord. Uh, he used the resources that he had at his disposal. Uh, he had the remaining priest of Nob, whom Saul hadn't slaughtered, Abiathar, uh, there with the ephod, whatever that is, some sort of a priestly uh, vestment or, or garment that was used to uh, discern uh, the will of the Lord. And David uses that to, to find out what he should do. Here's a man who takes his direction from the Lord. That's why it's so surprising a few chapters later in 1 Samuel chapter 27, verse 1, when we read these words, but David thought to himself, or literally David said in his heart, one of these days I'll be destroyed by the hand of Saul. The best thing I can do is to escape to the land of the Philistines. Then Saul will give up searching for me anywhere in Israel, and I will slip out of his hand. And that's just what David did. And as you read the narrator's account, you know if you've studied uh, the, the, the narrative in, in the Hebrew Bible in the Old Testament that it, it's very subtle. It doesn't come right out and, and say uh, things quite as uh, uh, plainly as it does in some other places. And sometimes you have to uh, read between the lines because the narrator is very subtle. Now, I would suggest to you that in 1 Samuel 27, based on David's past behavior, that we are supposed to say, whoa, wait a minute. David is not inquiring of the Lord. He is, he's listening to himself. He's, he's giving in to self-talk. He's talking to himself, saying in his heart, uh, where's God in this? Where's any inquiry? Uh, where's any prayer? Uh, why isn't he uh, consulting uh, Abiathar using the ephod to, to find out if he should do this or not? may well be a case of overconfidence. And so David uh, does uh, what he determined to do. And he goes and he takes refuge with the Philistines, and that's why he got into this difficult situation to begin with. And now he comes back and finds that, that he's facing a situation that he cannot handle. But what we see is David now, uh, in contrast with a prior failure, strengthening himself in the Lord, inquiring of the Lord, using the, the resources that God has given to him. Now, there's another contrast here that's important, and if you uh, know anything about uh, the, the book of Samuel, First and Second Samuel, you know that, uh, that in this storyline that, that one of the writer's purposes is to help us understand that David was qualified to serve as Israel's king. I, I think Herbert Wolf was right a number of years ago, and he wrote an article uh, arguing that that uh, 1 Samuel 15 all the way through 2 Samuel 8 is a is a dynastic defense. In, in other words, it's it, it's similar to some of the Hittite dynastic defenses where uh, a new king comes to power who is not part of the ruling family. And if that's the case, you've got to answer some questions. And you have to convince people that you are the right person to be king. You know, after all, you, you've just bypassed the royal line. And I believe that that's what the writer is doing in this section of Samuel. He's helping us see that Saul was disqualified to be Israel's king, that David was qualified to, uh, to take the throne, to be the Lord's anointed. And there's a really interesting contrast between David and Saul in these chapters. It starts back in chapter 20, uh, 28. And you have David and Saul and David and Saul. And you have these, these different panels and you can compare their responses. 
What's interesting, when you, when you work the timing, David arrived at Ziklag on the third day, and you, you follow the, the storyline that's being developed in these chapters, I think it's very possible that David inquires of the Lord within hours of, of Saul's inquiry. Remember who Saul inquired of. David uses the resources of Torah, he uses the, the ephod, Saul, of course, has destroyed all the priest of Nob. The one who remains flees to David. He has nowhere to turn, so what does he do? <clears throat> He's so desperate, he goes behind enemy lines. If you look at the geography of chapter 30 or 31, and he consults with, actually chapter 29, he consults with the medium uh, at Endor. First Samuel 28, in, in, in the bulk of that chapter, so here is, is David once again showing himself that he is fit to be Israel's king. That whatever failure he made back in chapter 27 not to inquire of the Lord, it's not a persistent failure like Saul. No, here he is. I believe God has given him more than he can handle to teach David to depend on him, to force David to depend on him. Without moralizing a story like this, we know from the New Testament that there are lessons that we can learn from these characters. What I find as I read this story is the reminder that, that God may sometimes give us more than we can handle to teach us to depend on him, to teach us to pray. You may remember the words of, of the hymn writer. Remember the hymn writer saying, oh, what peace we often forfeit all oh, what needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. I have a close friend who uh, last week went through uh, just a horrendous, uh, uh, difficult time in the life of her family. Her, her husband was, uh, was uh, perhaps going to be diagnosed with, with a very, very serious disease. Uh, one of her children was struggling in, her, in their marriage and and my friend the other day posted on, on Facebook, she says, oh, uh, that I would learn to, to, to pray, to continue to pray like I did last week. And I thought, it's just like this story, isn't it? God sometimes gives us more than we can handle to teach us to depend on him, doesn't he? So how did it turn out? Well, in verse 9 of 1 Samuel 30, we read that David and 600 men with him came to the Besor Valley where some stayed behind. 200 of them were too exhausted to cross the valley, but David and the other 400 continued the pursuit. They found an Egyptian in a field and brought him to David. They gave him water to drink and food to eat, part of a cake pressed figs and two cakes of raisins. He ate and was revived, for he had not eaten any food or drunk any water for three days and three nights. David asked him, who do you belong to? Where do you come from? And I love the way that the suspense kind of builds here. He said, I am an Egyptian, the slave of an Amalekite. Now, I don't know if that did anything in David, but, but it ought to in us. Say, wait, wait a minute, David was... the the Ziklag was destroyed by the Amalekites. Here's an Egyptian slave, a slave of an Amalekite. He said, my master abandoned me when I became ill three days ago. We raided the Negev, and I'm sure David uh, now was on full alert. We raided the Negev of the Carathites, some territory belonging to Judah, the Negev of Caleb, and we burned Ziklag. And I think, wow, the, the providence of God that David would just happen, he and his men would just happen to stumble across this Egyptian slave who had become ill and abandoned, uh, left to fend for himself. David asked him, can you lead me down to this raiding party? He answered, swear to me before God that you will not kill me or hand me over to my master and I will take you down to them. He led David down, and there they were, scattered over the countryside, eating, drinking, and reveling because of the great amount of plunder they had taken from the land of the Philistines and from Judah. David fought them from dusk until the evening of the next day, and none of them got away except 400 young men who rode off on camels, yes, camels, and fled. 
David recovered everything the Amalekites had taken, including his two wives. Nothing was missing, young or old, boy or girl, plunder or anything else they had taken. David brought everything back. He took all the flocks and herds, and his men drove them ahead of the other livestock, saying, this is David's plunder. Remember, it was not only what had been taken from Ziklag, but from uh, some of the surrounding uh, villages, from the, the, the Philistine territory. It's a rather amazing account, isn't it? God sometimes gives his people more than they can handle to teach them to depend on him. But the story's not over yet. There is actually a wonderful consequence in the, the remainder of the story of, of depending upon God. Verse 21, then David came to 200 men who had been too exhausted to follow him and who were left behind at the Besor Valley. They came out to meet David and the men with him. As David and his men approached, he asked them how they were. But all the evil men and troublemakers among David's followers, and remember David had assembled quite a a group of of renegades, and some of them were were rather sketchy, their, their backgrounds, There were some evil men, troublemakers among that group, and they said, because they did not go out with us, we will not share with them the plunder we recovered. However, each man may take his wife and children and go. See, their attitude is you only get what you deserve. But not David. David, in verse 23, replied, No, my brothers, you must not do that with what the Lord has given us. He has protected us and delivered into our hands the raiding party that came against us. And I would suggest to you that what David acknowledges here is the grace of God. It's what the Lord has given to us. It's not a matter of, well, this group went out and fought and risked their lives, and this group was too tired and they stayed behind. No, it's, this, this is what the Lord has given to us. He's protected us. He's delivered into our hands the raiding party that came against us. David says in 24, who will listen to what you say? The share of the man who stayed with the supplies is to be the same of him who went down to the battle. All will share alike. David made this a statue, an ordinance for Israel from that day to this. And what strikes me is that David, the one who depended on God, that God showed David his grace and he continued transforming David into a gracious person. It wasn't that long ago, if you go back to 1 Samuel 25, when David was ready to to slaughter a fool by the name of Fool or Nabal. You might remember that story in between two chapters where David has the conviction that he cannot take the life of the Lord's anointed when twice he had the opportunity to kill Saul. Right in between that, he runs into this, this wicked evil man that he and his men had helped out on several occasions, and David goes and asks him for help, and Nabal refuses and said, who is this David? There's all kinds of renegades running around. Why should I do anything for David? Remember that David is ready to, to kill him, to make a fool out of himself, until Abigail, a wise woman, intervenes and convinces David that he would be ruining his life. You know, here again, I suppose David could have taken the opportunity to retaliate harshly. You know, he uses his power. He draws a line in the sand. But he acts generously, doesn't he? He has been shown grace by God, and that grace is transforming him into a gracious person, into a gracious leader. In fact, in verse 26, when David reached Ziklag, he sent some of the plunder to the elders of Judah, who were his friends, saying, here is a gift for you from the plunder of the Lord's enemies. David sent it to those who were in Bethel, Ramoth, Negev, and Jatir, to those in Aror, Sifmo, Eshtemoah, and Rakal, to those in the towns of the Jeremielites and the Kenites, to those in Hormah, bore Ashan, Athak, and Hebron, and to those in all the other places where he and his men had roamed. 
Now, I realize that David is a man of savvy, and there may be some political motivations here. He realizes that, that he needs to have these people on his side when the day comes for him to consolidate his kingdom. But the fact is, throughout all of this, he's being generous, isn't he? And he's reflecting the grace of God at work in his own life by being gracious, by being generous to other people. You see, when you depend on God, God shows you his grace and he transforms you into a gracious person. Quality that all of us as God's people need, but especially as we move into leadership opportunities, we need that grace. As we come to the end of the story, we certainly must think about its place in, in the larger story. I don't know how you could read a story like this without thinking of the son of David, without thinking of Jesus, and I'm convinced that this story points to, to Jesus. Remember, there was a time in Jesus' life, times when, when he wept, the writer of Hebrews describes that, and I'd like to read for you Hebrews chapter 5, verses 7 through 10. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 7 through 10. This is what Scripture says about the son of David. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him and was designated by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. You see, Jesus was not only prophet, he was not only king, he was not only sage, but he was priest. What that means for us, Hebrews 4.16 is that we can approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and notice and find grace to help in our time of need. Thank the Lord that we have a Savior who is our priest. David had Abiathar. Oh, we have someone much better than Abiathar. We have Jesus, don't we? The one who died for sins, the one who was raised to life. The one who is at the right hand of the Father, who is our high priest. Sometimes when we think about pastoral ministry, I fear that, that we may have a, a, an idyllic picture of what it means to be a pastor. I'm sometimes astonished at how naive I was about the hardships of pastoral ministry. I should have known better because I grew up in a pastor's home. And I'm thankful for uh, parents who modeled what it meant to endure hardship as good soldiers of Jesus Christ. But somehow, I, I didn't see all of that. I remember these visions and dreams of, boy, the day when I will be serving a church. And of course, you, you don't factor in the hard times. No, everybody's going to like me and they're going to love my preaching and think I'm the greatest preacher that they've ever heard. And everyone is going to be dying to be discipled, about, but be discipled by me. And then you start to see some cracks in that picture as you begin to serve. And I could tell you story after story about times in, in 27 years of pastoral ministry where I felt like God had given me more than I could handle. I would want to scare you with that because I'll say now, pastoral ministry is a wonderful privilege and, and yet it's difficult. It's not easy. I remember one stretch a number of years ago when I was serving in Montana and uh, serving a church that probably couldn't pay uh, the, the kind of salaries that some did. And so we really relied on, on my wife's paycheck when she was uh, working in the, in, in the school system during the school year. I also taught at a, at a nearby Bible college, but that was during the school year. So uh, summer was always kind of that dreaded time. Boy, are we able, gonna be able to make it through uh, the, the summer and just limp along so we can get to the school year. I remember one particular summer when we had five drivers 
Uh, that would be my wife and I, three t- teenage kids who each had jobs, and we had two cars. Well, that was for the first part of the summer until uh, uh, one of our high mileage cars broke down, and, and I thought, how are we going to do this? We have one car. I think it was that same week that I found out that, that a leader that I was close to in our church was, was really undermining my leadership and turning a, a handful of people against me. And I remember how betrayed I felt, how devastated I felt. And I remember thinking, Lord, I, I don't know if I can handle any more of this. But I'll tell you what got me through that summer. It's really no secret. Uh, I learned to pray that summer. <laughs> I learned to pray as never before. I camped in Psalm 119. And if you know Psalm 119, we we talk about that being a celebration of the word of God, and it is. But much of that psalm is lament. The reason that the psalmist talks about the word of God is that's what sustained him through a very, very crushing time. And I remember that summer. I remember that God sustained me in ways I, I I never expected. And it wasn't all instant didn't happen in a moment. But here's a person who said, hey, you, you can use our car for, for the next three weeks while we're gone. One of our daughters had a nannying job in the family that, that she worked for. She said, here, just take our car. We have an extra car. I thought, what is it like to have an extra car? But she took their extra car. The leaders, the elders that I served with at our church, uh, this Betrayal thing caught them a bit off guard, but, but as they worked through and sorted through things, they, they were a great encouragement. And they helped me, they helped our church work through the situation and supported me in ways that, that I never expected. And it's God, isn't it? It's God at work in our lives, even in those difficult times when he gives us more than we can handle. He does that for a purpose. He does it not because he wants to harass us, not because he is against us, but he's, he's for us, isn't he? But he wants us to learn to depend on him. And just about every time I think I've learned that, you know, even after 27 years of pastoral ministry, you'd think I would learn that when I get into a situation that I can't handle to depend on God, and sometimes I feel like I have to learn it all over again. But the beauty of it is, as we learn and as we relearn that lesson, God in his grace showers us with grace in ways that we can never imagine and uses that grace to transform us so that we become gracious leaders as we work with others. Let's pray. Lord God, I pray that you will help us to trust in you with all of our hearts and to lean not on our own understanding in all of our ways to know you, trusting that you will direct our paths. We pray this for our good and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.